Case Western Reserve University's Institute for the Science of Origins proudly presents the Origin Science Scholars Program. The Institute advances the scientific understanding and application of the origins and evolution of human and natural systems. The Origin Science Scholars Lectures are presented with the assistance of Case Western Reserve University's Siegel Lifelong Learning Program, College of Arts and Sciences, and Media Vision. Tonight it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Glenn Starkman, who, as I'm sure most of you know, is the Director of the Institute for the Science of Origins. He's also Co-Chair of the Department of Physics and a Professor of Physics and Astronomy at Case Western Reserve University. Tonight, he's going to address some big questions. The universe is big, it's flat, so what does this mean about its shape? If it's big and flat, what's outside? I hope I'm going to find out. There's tantalizing hints that the universe is not infinite in all directions, and so how do you get from place A to place B? And for that, I'll leave it up to Glenn. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, so I'm going to talk about the shape of space. And I'm going to start by telling you that the universe is big, something you probably know and that it's flat, probably. And then we'll t move on to talk about the cosmic microwave background, which is our best probe of the large-scale universe. And finally, we'll come back and talk about whether it's big or infinite. So I want to start by uh, pointing out that light travels about this far, one foot, in a billionth of a second. You know, we usually talk about the speed of like 186,000 miles per second or 300,000 kilometers per second. It's really hard to imagine 300,000 kilometers. But, but a foot, that's something we all have experience with. And in one billionth of a second, uh, light can travel that far, which is really fast, but it's not infinitely fast. It means that it does take light a few billionths of a second to cross this room. And this is now something we can, we can measure. Uh, in fact, it affects all sorts, of, uh, all sorts of everyday communication issues and GPS and, and all, all sorts of things that we worry about when we build computers. Well, we're not going to talk about things in this room so much as we're going to talk about things outside this room, off the Earth, uh, starting with the solar system. So in the solar system, it takes light about eight minutes to get from the sun to the Earth. So now you have an idea just how big the solar system is. It's about 150 million kilometers uh, from, from the Earth to, to the sun. Okay, eight minutes, okay, or 500 seconds. But the solar system is incredibly small by the scales of the universe. If you go out on a, a dark night, uh, probably not in Cleveland, <laughs> and look up at the sky, you might see a, a, you know, something like this, the Milky Way, which, is, which has billions, hundreds of billions of stars in it. It's our galaxy. We don't see hundreds of billions of stars. Many of you remember Carl Sagan, who used to talk about billions and billions of stars. We don't see billions and billions of individual stars in our night sky, no matter how clear it is. We see thousands. And those thousands of stars are within about 100 light years. In other words, the, most, you know, the typical star out there that we're looking at, the light didn't leave this morning, it didn't leave yesterday, it left about a decade or two or three ago. Now, right now, looking at the Milky Way, you, it would be really hard to figure out what shape is the Milky Way. It it's really is a question of see, trying to see the forest for all the trees, but if we could step out of the Milky Way, we would see something that looks like this. This is a different spiral galaxy. You can tell why it's called a spiral galaxy. It has a spiral pattern um, called NGC 7331, which is a virtual twin of the Milky Way. And this galaxy uh, is about 100,000 light years across. So for example, someone told, uh, showed me uh, this evening a, a little article about something happening at the center of our galaxy. So the center of our galaxy is a black hole called Sagittarius A. Uh, and something happened three and a half million years ago there. If we were looking at something happening at Sagittarius A, it would take about 25,000 years for the light to get from there to here. So we wouldn't learn about it for at least 25,000 years. 
Now, so that sounds pretty big, the Milky Way, right? If we wanted, if there were other, we, you know, in this series we've talked about other intelligences around other, you know, on planets around other stars. If we wanted to communicate with them, if we wanted to send them a message, it would take tens of thousands of light years to get there and tens of thousands of light years to get back for if it was a typical star in the Milky Way. We might get lucky, there might be, you know, we might have friends on nearby stars, but it would still take tens of years. Now, there are obviously lots of other, of other galaxies, and typical galaxies live in groups of galaxies. We live in one which goes by the wonderful name of the local group. Okay. <laughs> it's kind of an anemic one. It doesn't deserve much of more of a name. A more typical one is something called the Virgo cluster. We call them clusters of galaxies. It's a little hard to see, but you see all those, you, you see some stars here, but you also see kind of fuzzy things that look like they may be galaxies. They are. Those are galaxies like ours or galaxies that are a little bit different. Uh, this is the Virgo cluster. It's about 60 million light years away, which means when we look at it, we look at it as, uh, as it was when, you know, when there were dinosaurs on the Earth. And it takes light about 10 million years to cross a typical cluster of galaxies like the Virgo cluster. But there are many, many clusters. Clusters are really big, but they're much smaller than the universe. There are many, many clusters. Um, and we can look out uh, and see lots of those clusters, and we can see lots and lots of galaxies out to the farthest distances that we can see, which is about 10 billion light years away. Okay, so we collect light. Uh, th this is an image taken mostly with the Hubble Space Telescope, but also uh, uh, amplified by other things, um, which used hundreds of hours of Hubble Space Telescope's time, which, as you can imagine, is extremely valuable. And they pointed it where there was pretty much nothing, right? where it looked really, really dark. Instead of pointing it at an interesting object, they print pointed it at somewhere where they, there wasn't much, and this is what they saw. They saw lots and lots of, those are galaxies. Let me sh um, focus in on, on one little piece of it. You see a, a pretty close galaxy there looking a lot like our Milky Way, but you see lots and lots of other galaxies. And we can see out to uh, actually a little bit more than 10 billion light years. Okay, so this is called the Hubble Ultra Deep Field, and this is the 2018 version. There have been a number of versions over the last 20, uh, 20 years. <clears throat> All right, so I hope I've convinced you, or at least told you convincingly, that space is big, okay. really, really big, much bigger than anything in our daily imagination. Okay. Um, but what does it mean to say space is flat? Okay. So forgive me while I digress and grab something. So most of us have seen something like this. It's a map. They used to come like this instead of on your cell phone. Okay, right? And they were very convenient, right? Because you could take this map and you could open it up and uh, you can put it on uh, a table, you know, and you could fold it in all sorts of nice ways. And, and you know, if you just happen to be in Paris, which is what this map was, and you wanted to go see you know, the Louvre, you'd put it down and draw a little line from where you were. Um, and the reason it's convenient is because uh, Paris is nearly flat. Okay. And so we could make this map of Paris that's flat. So Ohio is, is, is nearly flat, right? Not very, very many big mountains in Ohio. Um, so what does it mean to be flat? Well, it means that if I draw a line across Ohio, okay. I can draw another line across Ohio in such a way that the distance between those lines on the left side of, the, of Ohio, on the west side of Ohio, um, is the same as the distance in the middle and continues to be the same as the distance on the right. These are parallel lines. Okay. So I can draw parallel lines across Ohio and they stay the same distance apart all the way across Ohio. Okay. 
Now, it doesn't really matter if I draw them horizontally or if I tilt them. Uh, I can do that everywhere, every which way across Ohio. I can also draw triangles on Ohio or a map of Ohio. And if I let Ohio fade into the background and measure the angles of those triangles, here's the first one A, here's the second one B, here's the second one C. And if I went and got a protractor and measured those angles, they would add up to 180 degrees. And so that's what we mean. And it, it doesn't matter what triangle I drew, any triangle, the same thing would be true the angles would add up to 180 degrees. Okay. And so Ohio is flat. What about space? In other words, if I try to draw parallel lines in, in space, I sh will I find that a line that starts out, a pair of lines that start out a certain distance apart and continue a certain distance apart remain the same distance apart all the way across space? no matter which way I send those lines. So if I start with two light beams and send them out parallel to each other from the Earth, do they stay parallel all the way across the space? Or if I can manage to create a really large triangle in the universe and I measure the angles, those three angles, you know, will they be 180 degrees? And you might say, well, what else could something be other than flat? Isn't everything flat? Isn't it always true that parallel lines stay the same distance apart everywhere? And that if you have triangles and add up the angles of the triangles, it's 180 degrees. And the answer is absolutely not. Right? Here is an example of a place that isn't flat. And so I said Ohio is flat, but clearly the Earth is not flat. We've taken these wonderful, wonderful pictures of the Earth from outside, and we see that it's not flat. And you can focus in there on Ohio, and you will notice that it's a piece of the Earth. And so it's only almost flat. Right? It's a little piece of the Earth, so it's hard to notice that it's not flat unless you look very carefully. So you can start with a couple of parallel lines, and I haven't put them in Ohio, but in the middle of the ocean, and they will, they will stay the same distance apart for a while. But here, let me, let me draw them a little bit, far, start them a little farther apart. Here's one, it's heading from the equator north to the North Pole. Here's another one, it's heading from the equator north to the North, north Pole. Those were both going north when they started and yet they got closer and closer together as they got further and further north until by the time they got to the North Pole, they were in the same place. That's really strange. These were straight lines that started out what we would call parallel, but as they traveled over the surface of the Earth, they got closer and closer together until they met. And I can join them at the bottom with a line along the equator, a straight line along the equator. And now if I add up the angles of that triangle, well, the one, two at the angles at the bottom are actually 90 degrees. If you add those all up, you'll find that 90 plus 90 plus A is bigger than 180. Oops. And so the sum of the angles of the triangle is bigger than 180 degrees on a curved surface like the Earth. So Ohio is flat, or at least Cleveland is flat, or at least this room is flat, but what about space? In other words, if I send those light rays out there so that they're starting out parallel, so that they're starting at the, you know, where I've really tried as hard as I can to make sure that they're going in such a way that the distance between them stays the same, does it actually, in other words, if I measure the distance between them, is it a little bit closer when they, when it's really, really far away? Or if I could build a really big triangle and I measured the sums of the, you know, all three angles and add them up, would it be 180 degrees? Or would that actually be a little bit bigger than 180 degrees? Or a little bit smaller than 180 degrees? And so that's the question we want to ask. What shape is the universe? Is the un it's big, but is it actually flat? When you look out into space, 
how can, even with telescopes, can you see beyond the maze of stars that are in the way? So that's a great question. Um, it helps not to, so fortunately for us, if I could go back here and take a look at that picture of, um, of the Milky Way-like galaxy again. Okay. Fortunately for us, we live in a spiral galaxy. Okay. And we live in kind of a suburb of, the, of our spiral galaxy, about two-thirds of the way out, okay, where it's, it's relatively um, unpopulated. You know, uh, we, got, we have lots of space around us. And the good thing is, if we look up or down out of the galaxy, there's not much in the way. If we try to look through the galaxy, you notice the Milky Way, there's that, that dark band across the Milky Way. Okay, that's, it's hard to look through the Milky Way. Right? But if you look up and out of the Milky Way, it isn't so hard. Okay, and the, the, the night sky is actually pretty, mostly empty of stars. And even stars aren't so much the problem, it's really the gas and the dust that absorb the light. So it's, 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 it's not too hard to, to look out into the universe. Perhaps I'm not understanding correctly. When, uh, when you're saying you, you draw the parallel lines and they stay the same distance, I envision like a, uh, space is basically a vacuum that I understand. So if you have a, create a vacuum in a circular object and you do the lines through, they won't meet, but the space itself isn't flat. So you're asking an excellent question, okay? Which is, um, I was, you, uh, the example I gave was of lines following the surface, right? So if I shot, if I, if I actually sent laser beams, you know, north from, from the equator, they would go off into space, right? They wouldn't follow the surface. I was talking about, uh, you know, uh, someone driving a car or, 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 you know, or piloting a boat or, or, or even an airplane following the surface of the earth, right? So, uh, there are two. There are two ways to dis, that things can be curved. Okay. So we agree, do we agree that this map is flat? Okay. And what do I mean by flat? I mean that if I drew a triangle on this map and added up the angles, that it would add up to 180 degrees. Okay. But look, I can do. I can make the map. This map not flat anymore. Right. And yet, if I went and measured that same triangle. The angles would add up to 180 degrees. Right? I could draw parallel lines on here, like, like these creases, right? And yet, and, they'd be, and, and they would stay the same distance apart. And yet, if I bent the map, you know, and did things like that, it, it, they, they would seem not to be, not to stay the same distance apart on this, on this piece of paper. Okay. So the point is that um, I'm interested when I talk, when I say the map is flat. I don't care about how I've, how I've bent the map. I, I'm talking about if you lived in the map, if you were an ant crawling around the map, you would, and you, you performed this experiment of measuring the angles of a triangle, you would discover, go straight, turn right, go straight, turn right, go straight, get back to where you, you stood, you started, that the angle, the sum of the angles you had to turn through would be 180 degrees, living in the map. So on the surface of the Earth, if we forget about the fact that there's space out there, that, the, that, that doesn't happen on the, on the surface of the Earth. It actually takes more than 180 degrees of turning, turning to come back to where you started. Right? And that's what we mean by saying that the Earth is curved. Now, the Earth is curved in another sense, which if I stand outside of it and look at it, it looks curved. Okay? But I try to just convince you that that's not actually what I care about. So now we come to this question with space. What about space? And um, so there are these two concepts of curvature. What's, one's what's called intrinsic. The ant crawling around the piece of paper, irrespective of how I've managed to bend the piece of paper, the ant crawling around stuck to this piece of paper with their you know, nice sticky, sticky uh, paws, <laughs> sticky feet. What, do they what angles do they have to, to turn through? Okay. That's called intrinsic curvature. And then there's this other thing that's not very interesting called extrinsic curvature. And that has to do with just how I've chosen to position the map in space. 
So the surface of the Earth is curved in both senses. And that allows us to get really confused about those two things. Okay? But let me give you an example of something that is flat in, both, in, in one sense and curved in another. This is a piece of paper. We agreed a piece of paper is flat. The piece of paper is still flat in the sense that if I was an ant crawling around the surface of it, I would still turn through 180 degrees to make a triangle. If I drew parallel lines, they would still say the same distance apart. It looks curved. That's called extrinsic curvature, but it is intrinsically flat. And when looking at the night sky, you see constellations with names and shapes. Are the distances fixed? Are they in the same plane? Are they in other planes? And, and what do you know about that? So the different stars in, different, in a constellation are at all sorts of differences. They're, it's called a projected effect. Right? Some of those stars are close. Some of them are farther away. They're all far enough away that those constellations haven't changed very much in the last couple of thousand years. Um, but they changed a little. And we, we, are now, we now have uh, extremely good measurements of how fast those stars appear, are moving across the night sky. Uh, but it, it's taken until really recently for us to see more than the nearest few hundred stars moving. Now we can see millions of stars moving, because, but they move extremely little. Thank you for joining us. You have been watching me, Glenn Starkman, discussing what it means to say that space is flat or curved. For more information on the Origin Science Scholars Program, please visit the Institute's website at origins.case.org. Edu. In the next part of the talk, I will focus on the cosmic microwave background, the relic light from the early history of our Big Bang universe, and how useful it is for learning about our universe and its history. And now, back to the talk. All right, so the universe is big and flat, or is it? Okay. And I'm going to come back to this question of flat in a minute, because first I have to tell you, how would we possibly measure that the universe is flat or not flat. How can we, we, it's very hard to go, you know, if I want to measure that this room is flat, I could draw a triangle on a piece of paper or on the floor. I could even take surveying equipment out into Cleveland and figure out how flat Cleveland is. But it's really hard to take surveying equipment out into intergalactic space. So our best way of making that measurement is using something called the cosmic microwave background. And so I want to tell you about that. And it starts from the fact that not only is the universe big, but it's actually getting bigger. Okay. The, when we look out at galaxies that are more than about 50 to 100 million light years away, so when we don't look at the nearby ones, just the far ones, okay. we find that they're all moving away from us, no matter which direction we look. And we've known that since the 1920s. In fact, that was, was, was one of the things that made Hubble famous. And so space is expanding. And as space expands, its contents cool. So here's an example of something expanding and cooling. So the air that contained what became that cloud was rising up and expanding. And as it ex expanded, it cooled enough that the water vapor came, uh, you know, condensed and formed a cloud. That's how cumulus one way that cumulonimbus clouds form. Here's a, a more dramatic example where a, a, uh, an airplane has gone through the sound barrier and behind the, the, sh the shock wave, behind the, um, the, the, the supersonic shock, the air expanded and cooled and caused the water vapor to come out, you know, to, to condense and make a cloud. So expansion typically causes cooling. And so, if the universe is expanding and getting colder, then it used to be hotter. Okay. Um, and so, right now, the universe is a cold place. But once, it was as hot as the surface of the sun. When it was about a thousand times smaller, it was about as hot as the surface of the sun. Now, you've probably noticed, and don't try this at home, that if you look at the sun, it hurts. It's really bright. 
And yet I'm telling you that the universe used to be as hot as the surface of the sun. So why, when I look out at the universe, doesn't it glow like the surface of the sun? Okay. I must be missing something. Well, what I'm missing is what happens to light as it travels through an expanding universe. Is that the light waves, which are oscillations, get stretched just like the rest of the universe. So the universe is expanding, and it stretches the light that is traveling through it. Okay. So what used to be light that was about the color of the surface of the sun gets stretched to be longer and longer wavelength. So that means it gets redder and redder. and starts off as visible light, becomes red light, and then infrared light, and then microwaves, so that you look out at the night sky and you don't see it, not because it's not there, but because your eyes aren't very good detectors of microwaves. Right? If you look at the microwave oven in your kitchen, it doesn't look like it's glowing. It is. Well, hopefully not too, too brightly, because hopefully it has a good microwave blocker on the front, because you don't want to cook yourself. But you, you should be able to see it, it glowing. So you have to use better eyes, like this. This is the first set of eyes, it's a, a big antenna in New Jersey, that was able to see the glow of the microwave background, this light that comes from when the universe got cold enough that the light was able to travel through it. So as the universe used to be hot and then expanded, it got cooler, and at some point it got exactly cool enough for all of the electrons and protons, we've talked about those in the past, to get together and at that moment the universe became transparent. That was about 13.8 billion years ago and the light has been traveling through the universe ever since, getting stretched and stretched and stretched and so now that we, we can't see it with our eyes we have to use a microwave antenna like this. So I want to show you the map they made of the microwave background and that people have since made with the microwave background. So I'm going to, just like this is a, ma a map of the Earth, we're, 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 you know, what, what we do when we want to make a map of the Earth is we take a globe and we cut it and then we peel it out and kind of flatten it out, with an, you know, iron it down. So here is a, picture, a map of the Earth and I want to superimpose on that not a map of the Earth but a map of the night sky as you would be able to see it if you could see microwaves. Okay. It's not quite as interesting. It looks like that. <laughs> you can't see any. You wouldn't be able to see any difference. It looks exactly the same in every direction, almost. In fact, although we, we first saw the, this, made this map in the 1960s, it took 30 years for us to be able to see the differences between the, in the temperatures in different directions. And we did that first with this uh, this satellite called the Cosmic Background Explorer in the 1990s, and we've since improved on that with the Wilkinson Microwave Anisotropy Probe, or WMAP, in the early 2000s, and then the European Space Agency's Planck satellite in the, 20, in the, in the late 20, 2000s, early 2010s. Um, so what do they do is they, you know, they, they're look, this is a picture of the sphere of the night sky. This is everywhere, you know, you can imagine we're sitting at the center of this with, with some telescope and it's looking around in every direction and it's receiving the light that has been traveling through the universe for 13.8 billion years coming to it and it makes a map and what does it see? This, right, same thing, doesn't matter. But this, the, these new satellites are much more sensitive than that original antenna. Okay? So they can see the really tiny differences in that map and they're able to subtract. So let me not show this overall map, let me just make a plot of the little differences. Kind of like if we were making a map of the Earth, you wouldn't be interested in the fact that every spot on the surface of the Earth is about 6,000 kilometers from the center. You'd, you'd want to know how tall is that mountain, right? How deep is that valley? So I'm just going to show you now a map of the mountains and valleys, if you like, on the surface of the sky uh, in microwaves. And it looks something like this. Actually, this is the W map map. I like the colors better than the one in the Planck map. So I'm going to show you this one. Okay. So you see all these little blue spots and yellow and red. And I want to tell you what those mean in a second. Um, and we expected to see this. 
We expected to see this because of the work of this fellow, Jim Peebles, who started it all off, um, did a lot of the important calculations, and he just won the Nobel Prize uh, 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 about, about a month ago. And what he told us is that those bright and dim spots, or those blue and those red spots, are actually the imprints of sound waves that were traveling around the universe at that moment when it went from opaque to transparent, when it got, suddenly got cool enough for the light to be released. So there were acoustic oscillations, which is another word for sound waves, and that means that there were places that were dense, compressions, and there were places that were rarefactions, not dense, and the light had to climb out of the, uh, fight the gravity of those dense spots to get us, to us. And where it had to fight the gravity of the dense spots, it came, gets to us with a little bit less energy. And where it doesn't, it gets to us with more of its original energy. And so we see that as bright and dim spots or hot uh, and cold spots. So you can imagine these acoustic waves in the universe all the time, and acoustic waves, in other words, sound, traveling through the universe. Let me focus on one little region of that. Here is one of those acoustic waves traveling out from where it started. And like all acoustic waves, all sounds, they travel at the speed of sound. Not a speed of sound, at the speed of sound. Okay. Well, they travel at the speed of sound, and they started pretty much at the birth of the universe, at the beginning of the universe, until that moment they were traveling, until that moment when the universe got cold enough that the light could travel, could, could escape, and we could see it. So we look out, and we see the imprints of this sound in every direction, all the light being released at the same time, traveling for the same 13.8 billion years, and we look out in every direction, and we measure and we see these places where the universe was a little bit dense, so the light comes up to us with a little bit less energy, or a little bit less dense, so it comes to us with a little bit more. Okay. All right, so this map, then, is a map of the dense places. They are, they are pictured in blue, and the less dense places, and they're pictured in red. And what caused these is these sound waves traveling through the universe, traveling at the speed of sound. So let me focus in on a little bit of this map, just a tiny region. Here's about you know, a few degrees across. Okay? And what we see is that I've pictured here the distance that the light travels in that time from the beginning of the universe till the moment when the light that we're looking at. It turns out to be about 400,000 years. And the light travels a certain distance in that time because it travels at the speed of, of sound. Sorry, the sound travels a certain distance because it travels at the speed of sound. And so when we use a telescope to go look at it, it's like a giant triangle, right? We have this speed of sound horizon, the distance that sound traveled through the universe for the first 400,000 years out there. We know how big it is. You know, it's like if I held up a ruler and asked you, I, you would know, I told you this is a, uh, a one foot long ruler, and if I held it close, it would look big. If I held it far, it would look small, okay? But that's a triangle going from you out to the two ends of the ruler, and it's exactly the same. So here's, here's a nice little movie showing, showing WMAP doing that. You know, it's, it's, uh, here, is, here is the picture of the microwave background, that patch, and WMAP is going to measure it, and it's going to have a nice triangle out to a bunch of these patches, and that's what it should look like if the universe was flat. But what if the universe wasn't flat and the light, those parallel lines that make it up the, the, those lines that made up the side of the triangle actually came together a bit, then it would start to look different. Okay? So if the universe was like a sphere, those patches would look bigger. And if it was something else, it would look smaller. Let's not worry about that. Well, we go out and do this, and what do we find? We find that the universe looks extremely close to flat. In other words, we measure the triangles, the biggest triangle that we can imagine, with sides that are almost 14 billion light years long on one side, and another one that's only about 100 million light years across. And we discover that although the Earth is round, the universe is flat or very close. 
does it add up to 180 degrees? So that's the thing. It adds up to, as far to our ability to measure it, it adds up to 180 degrees. There are some indications. Some people would say, well, maybe it added up to a little bit more than 180 degrees, like 180.1 or 180.2, or no one's saying it made added up to 179.9. So it's adding up to extremely close to 180 at the, at the very least. I take it that sound is a mechanical wave in, in a medium and that uh, it must have a speed. And it, what was the medium at that point and what was the speed? So the medium is uh, very much like uh, the interior of the sun. Okay? So at that point, it's a medium that, that has uh, hydrogen, uh, ionized hydrogen and helium. Okay, uh, uh, very extremely like the interior of the sun, where you know you have for for every helium you have several several hydrogens, but the electrons have been stripped off. They're running around separately, and that's what that's it's called a plasma, an ionized plasma. Okay, and we know we can compute very very well the speed of sound through that plasma, okay? and so we know how fast the the, the sound waves were traveling. Well, kind of the obvious question is, what makes the universe flat? Why is the universe flat? That's a wonderful question. Okay. Um, in fact, it's much flatter than we have any re we would have had any reason to expect it to be. Okay. And uh, people really focused, started to focus on this question uh, back in the you know 1970s, 1980s. It was called the flatness problem. Okay. Why is the universe so flat? Um, and our best answer is that there was a period early in the history of the universe where the universe expanded much more quickly uh, than we would have thought. Okay. Um, and as you, you know, as you take, so imagine a you have a sheet of rubber with some wrinkles in it, right? And you start stretching it, then what happens to the wrinkles? They kind of get smoothed out, they get flattened out. And so the universe might have been curved, but as you stretch it, it gets harder and harder to see the curvature. You have to make measurements over much bigger regions. And so what, what they would say is the universe might have once been curved, but that curvature has been stretched away by this period we call inflation. And I'm going to come back to that, that idea in a minute. Um, we don't know that that's true, but this theory of inflation has made other predictions that we've been able to test, many of them uh, which, which, which seem to match all sorts of properties of our, of our universe. And I'll hint at some of those in a minute. So the map that you showed, it's, uh, you said the blue areas represented light coming from denser areas early, right. and the red less dense. Why would they represent it as blue if it took, if there, it took more energy to climb out of the blue. Wouldn't that shift it and slow it the other way? I mean, it's, it's just arbitrary? It's, it's, a, it's a color map that happens to be very good uh, for people to, to look at and see. OK, thank you. Yeah. yeah it's, and if I showed you the Planck map, you would get confused because it would look completely different. And it's just because they have a different color convention. OK? So yeah, it's, 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 it's an arbitrary choice that we make. It's not really blue. It's just lower energy. It's not really red. It's higher energy, okay? or uh, yeah, higher intensity. The CMB, uh, you've got the photons are released at about 380,000 years. They spread out. They go all over the place. They stretch as the universe stretches. Uh, and now we see them as microwaves. Will there, and the universe is cold. Will there be a point, or are we just lucky? Is there a point where those will fade completely or beyond our ability to even see the CMB? So as time goes on, those will continue to, the, the, the light of the CM, of the cosmic microwave background, the, the photons, the particles of light, will continue to get stretched. Okay, so today they're microwaves. One day they'll be long wavelength radio waves. It'll get harder. You, know, you will have to use different instruments to detect them. We won't be able to see them in a microwave antenna. We'll need some big, you know, big radio telescope. And then eventually we'll need an even bigger radio telescope. Uh, we may actually have, they'll start to have a hard time getting through the solar system. We'll have to send our telescopes outside the solar system to be able to, do, to see them. That will take 
Uh, they double in size about every 10 billion years. Okay. So for the foreseeable future, we can use the instruments we have now. But one day, they'll be, you know, as time goes on, they'll get harder and harder to detect. We'll need bigger and bigger instruments. Uh, they'll get fainter and fainter. Uh, and we'll see less and less um, uh, evidence for the fact that there's anything out there besides uh, the galaxy we live in and the nearby galaxies, and maybe, if we're lucky, the supercluster of galaxies called the Virgo supercluster that we live in, everything else will kind of be pulled away off, to, off beyond where we can see it easily. We hope you've been enjoying the Origin Science Scholars Program with me, Dr. Glenn Starkman, Director of the Institute for the Science of Origins and Co-Chair of the Department of Physics at Case Western Reserve University. In the second part of our talk, I discussed how we use the Cosmic Microwave Background, CMB, to measure the curvature of the universe. In our final segment, I will talk about the topology of the universe and how it could be probed using patterns in the CMB. Now, back to our talk. All right, so our last question is, is the universe big? Well, we know it's big, but is it infinite? We have this notion that the, you know, that the universe is infinite. I think most of I asked you, how big is the universe? You'd probably say, well, it's infinite, but, but is it? So let's start with this idea of flat universe. So I, I told you about the difference between a flat universe and a not flat universe, and I said that the universe is close to being flat. May, maybe, let's, let's just for now assume that it, it is flat, it's perfectly flat. Well, it turns out that there are many ways to be flat. Okay. And, and I showed you that, actually. I showed you two ways to be flat. I can be flat like this piece of paper, right? or I can be flat like the surface of this cylinder. And these are both flat in the sense that right, an ant crawling around on either of them, making a triangle by making you know, right turns, we would make three right turns, and the sum of the angles of those turns would be 180 degrees. And so just as that's true on the surface of this piece of paper, it's also true on the surface of the cylinder. Okay? So the surface of a cylinder is flat. And you can say, no, it is. And it's curved. And that's, remember, because we have two notions of curved. One is intrinsically curved. It's not. It's intrinsically flat. But it's extrinsically curved. In other words, because we live in three dimensions, it's easier for us to look at a cylinder from the outside rather than jump into it and kind of crawl around on a cylinder, okay. like the ant would do. So here is an example of a surface that looks curved, but it's actually flat. And what's distinctive about it is other properties, like the fact that notice that unlike on this piece of paper, where if I go off this direction, I keep, you know, imagine this paper, paper keeping going, I will keep going. I will never come back to where I started with if I head off in some direction. That's not true on a cylinder. Right? On a cylinder, if I follow one of these lines on my paper around, I will get back to where I started. Okay? It's a completely different space, also flat. Here's another example of a flat space that doesn't look flat, a cone. So a cone is flat. I just took this piece of paper and rolled it up in a particular way to make a different flat surface, a cone. Okay. Now, we can believe all of those. Here's one that's a little harder. And that's because if only we lived in four dimensions, I could do this demonstration very convincingly. So you see, what I did to make the cylinder is I took one side of the piece of paper and glued it to the, to the other, right? I, if I had been really careful, I would have just taken the edges and done that. But I didn't have to do it this way. I could have done it the long way. Right? I could have taken the, wrapped it around the long way. And I still would have gotten a cylinder. Right? Now, what if I did both the short way and the long way? 
So let's start. Here we go. Here's the short way. And the problem is, because I li we live in three dimensions, one, two, three, it's going to be really hard for me to glue this one to this one. Right? I'm going to make a real mess. If only we lived in four more dimensions, it turns out I could do it really easily. Okay. Okay. And what I would get is a torus, you know, the surface of a donut. That's also flat. It doesn't look flat any more than the surface of the cylinder did, but it is flat. So there are many ways to be flat. turns out there's also many ways to be curved like a sphere. Posit we call that positively curved or negatively curved, like the surface of a Pringle, a, a, a potato chip. Okay. So remember that our friend Jim Peebles uh, said that all those bright and dim spots are imprints of sound waves in the early universe. Okay. So here's something you know. The shape of a drum determines its sound. Right? You wouldn't expect these three drums to sound the same. That's, after all, why we have things like drum kits. Right? The big drums make deep, booming sounds, and the small drums make higher sounds. As you change the size or shape of a drum, the sounds that that drum can support change. Well, the same thing is true of the shape of the universe. Now, I'm only showing you here two-dimensional shapes, the surface of a cylinder, or the surface of a torus, or the surface of a, of a, of a cone. But the same thing is true in three dimensions, that the shape of a three-dimensional drum determines its sound. If you have different shapes, you have different sounds. And if you make the shape, the ob the shape big, you'll get lots of low sounds. If you make the shape small, you'll cut out those low sounds and only have the high sounds. But if you change the way the, sh the sides of the drum are oriented, if you change the shape of the universe, you will support different sounds. You'll allow different sounds to be heard. OK, so now I have to tell you a little bit about the answer to the question, this thing of inflation. I have to tell you about a theory of the early universe and the fact that it tells us something about the sounds that we should hear. Okay? So here's a whole slew of, of, of physicists who worked on this theory of the early universe and helped predict the, what we should hear. Um, they haven't won Nobel Prizes, uh, although probably at least one of them should, not for this, for something else. Uh, Alan Guth and So Young P and Andre Linde and Alexei Starobinsky and Slava Mukhanov and Paul Steinhardt and Andy Albrecht. They all worked on different aspects. On the, and I'm sure if any of my you know, colleagues saw this who aren't on that list, they would tell me, I should be on there too. And it's, it's true, it's a, it's a theory, this theory of inflation uh, that has had many, many people work on it over the last uh, 30 odd years. And one of the things that they've worked a lot on is predicting what sounds that early universe expansion would make. Because it turns out that even though the universe is being smoothed out by this expansion, that quantum mechanics forces there to be little noises being made. Okay. It doesn't allow it to be perfectly smoothed out. Even as you're smoothing it out, new ripples are being made. New sounds are being generated. And it's those that we see. Okay. Those are the ones that, we, that, that, according to our theory, we see. And the lesson from the early universe is that at least in the infinite flat universe that we talk about, what we should get is a cacophony in other words, noise, of notes all of equal volume. Okay. So every note that could have been in there and every note could be in there, they all should have the same volume. OK, so that's a prediction that we can test. We can go out and look and ask, do we hear and when I say here, I mean by looking at the cosmic macro microwave background and looking at the notes. Wh what do those notes mean? Well, what will low notes be? Low notes will be long, large patterns. Okay? They'll be you know, a, a low note, like one made by a, uh, a, 
a, a, a double bass. It has big long strings, right, to make those low notes. So there'll be lo long wavelength patterns on the sky. And the high notes, like what might be made by a violin, those will be short strings, those will be short patterns. And this, this theory predicts that all of those patterns should be there in a very disorganized way. In other words, if I know what the low note is, I won't know exactly what the high notes is. Very disorganized way, um, but, but equal volume of high notes and long, lo, uh, low notes. So what do we measure? Well, indeed, when we go look at the high notes, at the small patterns, we will find pretty much exactly what the theory told us we would. In other words, if I looked at this picture carefully and analyzed all the different patterns that are in here, all the different notes. So think of this as a giant spherical drum, and I'm analyzing the sounds that I'm seeing on that drum. Okay. So if I allowed it to vibrate, I, would, I could actually listen to the drum. And all of those high notes would be there, and it would sound terrible. It would sound like noise. But what about the low notes? And you can start to see this for yourself. Okay. If you look carefully, you'll notice that the top left of this map doesn't have very many big patterns. Unlike if you look in the middle, you'll see this big pattern and the you know, of blue, this big patch of blue. And then next to it, you'll see this kind of big patch of yellow and red and green. And the next to it, you'll see this big patch of blue. Those are these large patterns, these low notes. And notice that those are much more missing from the top. So it turns out that those low notes, those large patterns, aren't following our theory. They're too quiet. And they're also kind of harmonious. In other words, they're organized like, like music instead of like noise. So I said the low notes are too quiet, and the low notes are too organized, unlike what the theory predicted. So the question is, what is causing this organization? Okay. And the leading theory is that it's a complete fluke. It's just an accident. We're really good at seeing patterns. You know, our brains have evolved to pick out all sorts of patterns. And so people like me and my colleagues who've noticed that these low notes are, are you know, too organized and too quiet, we're just fooling ourselves into thinking that there's something interesting about that. It's just an accident. And the other possibility is it that it's the shape of the universe that's actually modulating the noise of the Big Bang. That the shape of the universe is saying, actually, not all the notes can be here. And the ones that are, they're going to be aligned with each other in certain ways. Just like when you, a composer writes a score, it doesn't say, OK, everyone play. Okay, they're going to say, OK, the cellos and the bass and the violin and the tuba, you all, have, you all have your notes, and you all have to play together. And that's what not an infinite universe would do, what a universe that's finite, even though it's flat, and has a shape that's interesting would do. So where are we? Well, at this point, we're kind of like giant bats that are trying to use the echoes of the Big Bang uh, to find our place within the universe. And we don't know what it is yet. We're searching for the shape of the universe. And what I can really say is stay tuned, because there's a very good chance that over the next five years or 10 years, that we're going to have a better and better sense of whether, in fact, what's going on is the, finite sh the shape of the universe and its finite size organizing the notes of the Big Bang, or it's just a fluke. Thank you. The Origin Science Scholars Lectures are presented by Case Western Reserve University's Institute for the Science of Origins, with the assistance of the Siegel Lifelong Learning Program, the College of Arts and Sciences, and Media Vision. For more information on the Origin Science Scholars Program, including a full video archive, please visit the Institute's website at origins.case.edu.